thank you for having me and uh, uh, doing such a great job in supporting uh, a scientific approach to uh, dealing with this very serious problem of artificial light at night. Um, I want to start off by just telling you what we'll talk about. We're going to talk about artificial light and, and what it is and how it came to be. We'll talk about the spectral properties of artificial light and why it matters. Uh, we'll switch then to talking about light and vertebrate neurophysiology, uh, and then its impact on humans and birds, some of which you already know and are obviously trying to deal with. And then at the end, how to reduce uh, the impact of artificial light at night. Uh, and in the medical field, we always have to declare whether we have conflicts of interest, and I do not have any. So if we um, start traveling in the direction of the constellation Coma Bernice, and we travel at the speed of light for about half a million years, and then we look back, this is about what we would see, the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and we would be coming from somewhere around there. Um, if we headed out in the direction of Gemini, uh, we would see it this way, uh, and we'd be somewhere in one of these arms. Uh, but we're in the middle of the Milky Way, and we can't go to the outside. And we see it from inside, looking uh, either towards the inside, the center part of the galaxy in this direction, or six months later uh, to the winter side, the outside of the galaxy. More than about 120 years ago, 130 years ago, every human being on Earth could see the Milky Way. And now in the United States, probably only 10% of the people live where they can see the Milky Way. And in Europe, almost no one can see the Milky Way at night. The Earth formed about 4.8 4 billion years ago when the sun coalesced. Uh, and ever since then, half of the time uh, of each day, uh, half of it is in darkness. Uh, and that was true again until about 130 years ago. All the light at night that was artificial came from fire. And we, we remember Abraham Lincoln growing up, reading diligently by firelight to become educated. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. We have now electric lights. But the half of the earth that was in darkness is no longer in darkness in, in a lot of places. And you can see from uh, this video that uh, most of the uh, populated areas of the earth are lit some of them very much so. Uh, as Europe comes around, you can see uh, just how many lights uh, are present. Uh, and here's Spain and France and England. Uh, and if we get to the United States, it's the same thing. And um, this is really a serious problem because as we'll see, it's growing at quite a rapid rate. Here we have South America and here's the United States. We'll have to go to the next slide. Um, the first electric streetlights were put up in Los Angeles in 1876. These were four arc lamps uh, that ushered in a new world. But the real impact happened two years later when during the Paris Exposition in 1878, uh, many streets were lit up with arc lamps. And here we have, the, if you're familiar with the, the Avenue de l'Opera, and here's the Salle Garnier where the Paris Opera plays. Uh, and uh, the, the, the cat was out of the bag and the cow was out of the barn and uh, street lighting rapidly took off over the next two years. London was lit up two years later uh, and then the United States. Edison invented the carbon filament light bulb in 1879 uh, and the tungsten filament bulb, which lasted much longer, was invented in 1904. And through the early part of the 20th century, uh, there was a progressive increase in outdoor lighting uh, as uh, urban areas uh, lit up, as automobiles had headlights, uh, and as electrification of uh, the United States and, and civilized uh, parts of the world uh, grew very rapidly. High intensity LEDs, light emitting diodes, uh, were uh, developed in the late 1990s. LEDs were first invented in the 1960s, but they were small, low power devices. Uh, but it was only in the late 1990s that they became uh, bright. Uh, and capable of lighting interiors and exteriors. The first LED street lights were put up in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2006. Uh, and the LED market share in 2011 was just 1%, but in 2019, it was already 47% and predicted by 2030, almost all the lights you'll find anywhere will be LEDs. 
Uh, they're less expensive uh, to run, uh, and they last much longer, as you know. But because they use less energy, instead of just keeping the same amount of lighting, uh, for lower cost, you can put up more LEDs, still save some money and have more, more lighting. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, even though electrical costs may be slightly less, the total amount of lumen output is greater. And we see that as, as, as increase in light pollution, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, many LED bulbs uh, are enriched in the blue part of the spectrum. Uh, and the original LEDs, the so-called uh, bright white LEDs, uh, as we'll see, have a substantial amount of blue light, and that's very problematical physiologically. Uh, and here's an example, streets in Calgary, uh, before and after conversion from uh, high-pressure sodium lamps uh, to uh, regular LED lighting. You can see how blue uh, the environment is compared to the yellow tint uh, of the pre-conversion lighting. Now, light pollution, as it affects uh, uh, the sky, uh, has three major components. One is sky glow, one is glare, and the other one is light trespass. Sky glow is simply the diffusion of light in, in the atmosphere that reduces the contrast uh, between the darkest and lightest parts of the night sky. Uh, and so we can look here and we see the teapot of, of Sagittarius. He's supposed to be an archer, but all the astronomers call him a teapot. Uh, and we can see the scorpion, Scorpio, which actually does look a bit like a scorpion. Um, the Milky Way runs right through this region, as you can see, or as you can't see, there's no Milky Way. Glare is when a bright light gets in your eye, which is, it's not intended to go there. It's supposed to light something else up. And that creates light trespass, which is lighting where it is, doesn't need to be. This light is lighting up the side of this building for no particular reason. And even worse is going into these windows where perhaps somebody's trying to sleep uh, on the inside of the house. Uh, and you saw this uh, in the uh, um, uh, advertisement for the talk. Uh, this is uh, a house in Toronto. Uh, and Todd, Todd Carlson uh, lived in this house. and. Uh, uh, he took a photograph, and you can see all those factors. You can see the sky glow washing out the night sky. And here's Sagittarius down here, by the way. Uh, and uh, here's some glare and light trespass as he lights up the front of his house, and he lights up this tree for no particular reason, and maybe uh, his uh, uh, outside uh, walls and, and uh, plants. Uh, but then they had a power uh, failure, uh, and he simply went outside and took another picture. He had some candles lighting up the inside of his house, uh, and now you could easily see the Milky Way, Sagittarius and Scorpio. Uh, the Bortle scale uh, is uh, a measure we use to uh, rate our night sky. We do have instruments that can uh, tell us uh, how dark the sky is. Um, but commonly we talk about zones from one to eight or nine uh, invented by a fellow named John Bortle. Um, our club observes at Ward Pound Ridge, where I'm sure many of you have, have gone birding, uh, and we would expect that to be uh, a, at least a suburban rural transition. Uh, it's Danbury is about 20 miles to the north, and uh, Mount Kisco is not that far to the south, so we, don't, we would hope it would be rural, but it's not. Uh, what we've been seeing lately is that it's mostly a bright suburban sky. We've really lost a lot of this light. And of course, in the city, you're down in here. Um, and if you map out uh, the sources of light, um, uh, there's been growth of, uh, of nighttime lighting uh, throughout the world. And in the United States, it's certainly uh, gone rather rapidly in the East Coast. This is a prediction. This was a 2001 study, um, but there is later data that I'll show you. And you can see essentially the entire East Coast is, is wiped out. It's very hard to find a dark sky. Uh, east of the Rockies pretty much now, except for maybe some of the rural areas in western Nebraska and, and in Kansas and the Dakotas. Uh, here's a satellite image of the New York City area. And you can see uh, how brightly lit up uh, Manhattan, uh, the, uh, the conurbation of Manhattan is. And you can see, of course, lighting along uh, I-495 and I-95 and 287. Uh, but when you superimpose uh, the light pollution map that is obtained by satellite data, uh, you can see that the whole area 
uh, is just flush with lights and it extends uh, into areas that really ought to be uh, much less lit up uh, because of the diffusion of light through light, light trespass and uh, through sky glow. Uh, now, <clears throat> the two sa 2017 satellite data showed that there was a 2% annual increase uh, in, in night lighting, but the satellite cameras that were being used were not sensitive to the blue wavelengths. And since the growth uh, of lighting, outdoor lighting, uh, has been with LEDs, uh, it means that the data is, is not accurate. Uh, it also can't detect horizontal light pollution, light that is shining sideways, but not... Uh, going upwards, and some of that light will uh, diffuse upward as well to form sky glow. It might not be detected, however, by satellites. So the Citizen Science Project uh, uh, asked people simply to go out and take a look over time as to what is the faintest star that they could see. Uh, in a very dark sky, you can see stars down to at least the sixth magnitude. Uh, in New York City, you probably can see maybe Sirius at night and maybe one or two other stars of the first magnitude. Uh, but in, in suburban areas and other areas, you might be able to see down to three, four, or five. So simply by looking over a 15-year period, uh, citizens rated and logged the number of the, the stars that they saw that were the faintest. And the star counts by people showed that there was a 10% annual increase in light pollution, not 2%. Uh, it's worse in North America. It's pretty bad in Europe. But on the global average, it's about 9.6%. Uh, and this was published uh, in September in, in Science Magazine, which is the American Association for the Advance, Advancement of Science, and some of you may be members. And you can see that from satellite images. This was a paper published in Science Advances, another uh, AAAS journal. Uh, and they simply took satellite photographs, uh, photographs from the International Space Station uh, of major cities in Europe, uh, and uh, showed that uh, over a period of just a few years, uh, the lighting, these are all calibrated photographs, uh, the amount of lighting increased and the spectrum of the lighting changed from a yellowish tint to a bluish tint. And this is all due uh, to the introduction of LEDs. And here's London in particular, is, it has really become extremely blue, which red as well. So the blue light is a problem. And the question we have to start asking first is, why is the sky blue? And I assume you all know the answer and never ever gave one of your grandchildren uh, a wrong answer to this question uh, when they asked. Um, but we'll just review it for a second. We know that the visible spectrum uh, is from 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, we've evolved our eyes in daylight for uh, photopic vision uh, to be able to distinguish colors uh, in that range. Um, and we know that the sun puts out a bell shape, a, a, a skewed bell shaped curve. Uh, of wavelengths, uh, and uh, this is uh, because it's a black body, so it's putting out thermal radiation, uh, the bulk of which is between 400 and 700. Uh, there's a little bit of UV, and then there's a good tail of infrared. And you can see that the amount of wave, the number, the intensity of the wavelengths uh, between 400 and 700 isn't all that different, uh, maybe a 25% difference. The blue light is preferentially scattered by the small molecules in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and as a result, the sky is blue. This is called Rayleigh scattering. Uh, it scales as the inverse fourth power of the wavelength. And you can see there's much more scattering of blue light uh, than there is of green, yellow, or red light. So that's why the sky is blue. Uh, fortunately, for most of the 20th century, or all the 20th century, but not the 21st, uh, our lights were incandescent, uh, and they had very little output in the uh, 400 to 500 nanometer wavelength. Uh, much of their, uh, their output was uh, uh, in red and infrared. It's one of the reasons why tungsten bulbs are hot. Uh, and again, compared to daylight, uh, daylight had even more blue that was diffused. Um, back when I was a kid, I seem to recall there was one road in Long Island that had low pressure sodium lights that we drove on. I grew up in the Bronx, but we would go visit Uncle Somebody in, in, in Long Island. And there was one highway that had these low pressure sodium lights that were bright yellow. Uh, and they were very weird. They never really caught on that much. Um, 
astronomers love them because you can get a filter that just filters out this little narrow band of, uh, of wavelengths. And so your, your image would be uh, much, much more contrasty than it would be without the filter. High pressure sodium lights, which are most of those gooseneck lamps that were around for about 50 years or 60 years, um, had a, a, a broader diffusion of wavelengths, but you could still filter out a lot of these. But the problem is LEDs. LEDs um, put out a broad spectrum of light, and especially the first ones that were introduced and were put up in the first uh, go-round uh, of uh, changeover from uh, high-pressure sodium lamps to, uh, to LEDs were very much enriched in the blue. And these are those uh, horrible uh, lights on cars that, that shine in your eyes, and they're so bright white and blue. Uh, and you can see they have a peak in the blue uh, that is much greater than they need to be, which is really where you want the light to be here, compared to a 2800 Kelvin LED uh, that mimics an incandescent bulb. Uh, the first uh, LEDs were made uh, very bright and white, and people kind of liked that because it gave that uh, uh, really crisp color uh, and definition. Um, it, they were also easier to make. You have to put in special phosphors uh, to change the lighting spectrum of the LEDs. But now there are, for the same prices, available uh, in a incandescent uh, spectrum that's much better on the eyes and, and much more pleasing. Because the blue light scatters, that's true for LED blue light as well. So if you compare two low pressure sodium lights at, a, at one, uh, there's uh, eight times more scattering uh, of the LED uh, white light ones, 5100 Kelvin, uh, and that even at 300 kilometers is still four times as great. It's uh, better but not perfect with a 2400K um, light. So blue light scatters more and ruins the sky, night sky for observers, but is it deleterious for humans and animals? So, you know, I think you should all support our desire to have great uh, viewing with our telescopes, but in actual fact, uh, that's not the most important uh, issue uh, for artificial light at night. The real question is, is it harming human health, uh, animal health and behavior? And we wouldn't be giving this talk, of course, if the answer was no. Uh, so we're gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about the physiology of vision uh, and how uh, lighting at night affects uh, human physiology and, and vertebrate physiology. Uh, you know about the circadian rhythm. Uh, we evolved in a uh, diurnal uh, cycle, a 24-hour cycle, uh, and uh, that's controlled by the human nervous system, but it's also uh, it reacts to uh, that light sequence. All phyla on Earth have circadian rhythms, including plants and bacteria. It's not something that is uh, only available uh, to vertebrates or advanced uh, evolved uh, species. Uh, in 1917, the Nobel Prize was awarded uh, to three researchers for their discoveries uh, about the mechanisms for controlling the rhythm. They use fruit flies, um, but as you'll see, uh, what they learned uh, applies to uh, human beings and, and all vertebrates as well. Uh, they discovered the clock gene. This is a gene that uh, encodes a transcription factor uh, that then causes the preferential uh, synthesis of a bunch of proteins. Uh, but what's interesting about the circadian rhythm is even though it's inherent to the human, uh, to the vertebrate nervous system, uh, it's modifiable in response to light and dark cycles. This is called entrainment. And I'll show you an interesting uh, study about how that works. Uh, and in vertebrates, it's coupled to melatonin production in the pineal gland. Um, now, the vertebrate eye, we'll take a human eye because I had the, that is the best picture for me to, to show you. Uh, we make images with our rod cells and cone cells. The cone cells are for scot uh, scotopic vision, which is day vision, and the rod cells uh, are for, uh, uh, excuse me, let me go back. Uh, the cone cells are for photopic vision and the rod cells are for scotopic vision, which is night vision, uh, which takes uh, a period of time when you go from a bright light to uh, darkness 
for your rods to get their maximum sensitivity, about 15 minutes. But in the 1960s and 70s, it became clear that there was another non-imager forming pathway. And it was only about 50 years ago that uh, these so-called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells were discovered. They're on the superficial layer of the retina. Uh, they don't form images, uh, but they do detect light. And they detect light with a peak sensitivity in the blue at 482 nanometers. Uh, and they use a, a distinct uh, protein uh, to react to the light called melanopsin rather than rhodopsin uh, in the rod cells. Uh, this non image forming pathway leads to uh, the suprachiasmatic uh, nucleus. Uh, and uh, that's the center where the circadian clock and vertebrates lives. So the exposure to blue light or the absence of blue light will either trigger or suppress the output of these intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. They link to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which will send nerve impulses to the rest of the body, but will also send nerve impulses to the pineal gland, uh, which during waking cycles will suppress melatonin and during sleep cycles will increase the secretion of melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone. Uh, it's made from tryptophan and it's secreted by the pineal gland uh, and is suppressed by light. It is a G protein, has a G protein coupled receptor. That means that there's a protein receptor on the surface of cells uh, that will bind to the melatonin and then create chemical reactions in the cytoplasm of the cell that can lead to uh, changes in gene expression, uh, changes in metabolism, uh, effects on the immune system, changes in cell growth, and even changes in cardiac function. It's also an anti-neoplastic and antioxidant to a small degree, uh, and its levels decrease with age. So the amount of secretion as you get older is less, and that may account for some of the uh, changes in sleep patterns that older patients have. Um, and people always ask, well, well, can I take some oral melatonin and that'll make me sleep better? And the answer is probably not. Uh, it may help a little bit in sleep induction, but it's not good for uh, sleep maintenance. Uh, and the other thing is it's not a drug, it's, it's a supplement. So it's not FDA regulated. Uh, and the amount of melatonin in any particular uh, formulation can really vary. And so you can't really trust uh, that you're getting a constant dose. But as you can see, when the lights begin to go out, so-called dim light mean onset time, melatonin rises, and then it decreases uh, when the sun comes back up. Uh, when melatonin goes up, your body temperature goes down, and your serum cortisol levels go up uh, as well, and they peak uh, just after the melatonin peak. So the melatonin gets to your cells, it signals them to make cortisol, and the cortisol comes out a few hours later. The entrainment of the um, circadian rhythm is really lovely demonstrated by this study. Uh, it was done in Germany in the 1960s. Uh, they induced a medical student to uh, live underground for 40 days. He had windows, and for the first seven days, the windows were uh, not shuttered. Uh, and so even though he was in this room, he was getting a typical day-night cycle. And as you can see, his wake time and his sleep time, um, waking in blue and sleep in yellow, um, were pretty much uh, identical every day. Uh, but then they shut the, they closed the shutters and they kept him in the dark. He still was able to turn lights on. He wasn't living totally in the dark, um, but he didn't have any exogenous uh, source of light. So he lost uh, direct contact with the 24 hour cycle. And after a few days, uh, his circadian rhythm began to change and his cycle, instead of being 24 hours long, uh, became 25.4 hours long. So he lost his entrainment and he actually lost an entire day until they turned the lights back on. And then he very quickly became re-entrained and had his regular 24 hour cycle uh, with the same time for waking and the same time for going to sleep every day, except this day, uh, we're not sure what happened. Maybe his girlfriend came over. We don't really know. Uh, but in any case, you can see that uh, it's the combination of the internal clock uh, and the entrainment with 
uh, the, the day-night cycle. This is all under genetic control. We won't go into great detail except to say that it's a feedback loop. There are these products of these two genes, CLOCK and BMAL1. Uh, they activate genes by uh, uh, binding to an enhancer box. And then downstream from that, there are the specific genes for the variety of proteins uh, that go uh, from the nucleus. Um, the mRNA goes to these uh, ribosomes. They make the proteins that go out into the into the body, but they make two particular groups of proteins called period proteins and cryptochrome proteins. Uh, these proteins will then build up in the cytoplasm, go back into the nucleus when the concentration is high enough and turn off the effects of clock gene and BMAL1. So it's a typical feedback cycle where as the rates go up, all the products get made. When these are high enough in the cytoplasm, go back to the nucleus, it turns off, then everything goes back down. And when it's low enough, it, there's not enough to suppress this anymore, this starts up again. And you can see that there's a cycle that's gonna have some periodicity. And the way we can look at that uh, is through something called uh, a reporter protein using luciferase. Luciferase is the enzyme that makes fireflies grow. Uh, and it's very useful because the gene can be implanted uh, into uh, into DNA near other genes, uh, and get and luciferase would get then get made when these particular genes are activated. So uh, in this cartoon, you can see that the luciferase is bound to the promoter, or it's bound to the gene that gets activated by the promoter. Uh, when the promoter is activated, luciferase can be made. Uh, and then it goes out into the, into the cell and then it will light up spontaneously. Uh, whereas in this case, it'd be bound to the period protein. Uh, and then when a period protein comes out, then you would see the luciferase. So this looks like somebody's nose, but it is not somebody's nose. This is actually a slice through a mouse brain through the suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, in a mouse that's been labeled with this luciferase reporter protein. And you simply take this uh, uh, mouse brain slice, you put it in a dark chamber, uh, you put a camera on it, uh, and you let it go and uh, make a recording over a few days. So this is a sped up recording uh, of luciferase uh, being synthesized in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And as you can see, there's a periodicity to it. Each peak is 24 hours. And there may even be a, a flow that the, the neurons themselves that, are, that contain this luciferase uh, may be starting on the outside and then going to the inside. So there's an internal uh, synchronization uh, of, the, uh, of the nerve impulses. And you can take these nerve cells and put them in nerve culture, in a cell culture, uh, and if you uh, put your detector on just one of the neurons, you can actually measure uh, the light output. So again, these are this is the the genetically driven circadian rhythm in the cells of the suprachiasmatic nucleus that have been put in culture. Now it isn't just those nerve cells that express these gene products. Uh, this is a culture of mouse fibroblasts. These are cells that make connective tissue uh, and uh, are important for cell, uh, for support of uh, bones and, and tendons and cartilage and other structures, blood vessels. Uh, and these cells also uh, were uh, treated with the luciferase promoter protein. And you can see that they too have a periodicity. I don't have a a live recording as the other one does, but you can see that there's a 24 hour cycle in these, in these cells. And in fact, all cells in the body that have been, that have been studied have some form of, of circadian rhythm. Now, the way this works uh, uh, genetically uh, can be shown in this very interesting study. Um, that utilize mice in which one of the in genes was knocked out. And then through some breeding experiments, you can have mice that either have two alleles of the normal gene for clock, one with a knockout 
in one allele, so they're only operating with one, or one where both clock genes are wiped out. Uh, so the mice are in their normal, uh, in their cages with uh, the windows open and, and unshuttered, so they're getting a 24-hour cycle. Uh, and then they put them in the dark. That's what DD is, they're in the dark. And you can see that if they have the normal gene, they lose their entrainment, and these mice, their cycle is 23.6 hours. If you have only one of the alleles working with one knockout, you can see that it becomes a 25 hour cycle. And so they begin to lose an hour a day. And then if you knock out both genes, they still have a cycle. It looks pretty chaotic, but they actually have a 28 hour cycle. So there's an interaction between the genetic control of the circadian rhythm uh, and the normal day night cycle of light and darkness. This has become an area of intense research. Uh, and uh, when you put in uh, the words artificial light at night into PubMed.gov, which is the National Library of Medicine's research uh, library, uh, you can see that over the last uh, 60 years, the number of uh, citations has grown dramatically. And so there's a lot of research interest uh, in, uh, in artificial light and its effects on physiology. In humans, um, and there's a number of effects. These are mostly uh, determined by epidemiology uh, and the source of the um, uh, lighting intensity is based on of those satellite images, which I told you, uh, satellite uh, measurements, which I told you were not all that accurate because they lack blue sensitivity. But that's pretty much what you have. Uh, and through epidemiologic studies, there have been effects on sleep, uh, risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, definite increased rates of obesity, poor glucose control. These are probably related. Uh, interestingly, in young adults, they get atopic diseases. These are things like eczema. Uh, blood pressure is higher at night and a definite increase in behavioral disorders uh, in areas that have high nighttime lighting. The real problem is to determine whether these are causative effects or just correlations with other factors uh, in these environments. But nevertheless, in 2012, the AMA issued uh, a report on light pollution uh, and its adverse effects. Uh, and in 2019, the World Health Organization declared night shift work a carcinogen because of the high, high uh, amount of breast uh, and other cancers in, in night workers. It's hard to do real studies on human beings. Uh, most people don't want to be in a cage and they don't want to be locked up for weeks or months or be uh, taken away for their daily life. But there are a few studies uh, short term that show some effects uh, of what happens uh, because of uh, blue light. Uh, and in particular, uh, one interesting study uh, looked at the effect uh, of, of, of light from uh, handheld uh, devices uh, before bedtime, which we all do, right? We're all looking at our phones or looking at our computers uh, and then we get into bed. And uh, the problem is that uh, most of these uh, e-books and, and the iPhones and computer screens uh, all have spectral peaks in the blue, except apparently the Kindle. Um, so what the, these researchers did was uh, they simply took a group of people, they had them read an e-book in bed for an hour or two, uh, for a week, uh, and then the next week they read a regular book by incandescent light or the other way around. And so it was a crossover study uh, and everybody did, did both. Uh, and they found that the ebook readers suppressed their melatonin by almost 50%, uh, that the dim light melatonin onset uh, was more than 1.5 hours later on the following day. And it took 10 minutes longer to fall asleep and they had less REM sleep and felt sleepier in the morning. Uh, so we're all gonna look at our phones and we're all gonna look at our computers. Uh, how do you deal with that? One possibility is you can get these glasses to filter out a lot of the blue light. Uh, these cost about 30 bucks there. And if you go on Amazon, you can see them. Uh, I keep telling myself I should do it, but, uh, but I don't. But in any case, that's one possibility. The other thing is to read a real book. Okay, here's, here's a real book. Uh, 
the entire biosphere is affected, and here's a large number of organisms that have been studied. There are obviously this is not a complete list. Uh, there's a huge amount uh, of uh, research uh, in uh, in the non-human uh, part of the uh, the biosphere. Um, something that you're familiar with, because obviously we talked about it uh, before we started the lecture, was the issue of uh, urban lighting and its effect on birds. Uh, and in New York City, of course, uh, you know, 200 years ago, none of this was here. The birds were happy to fly over, uh, but now um, they have to encounter all these light sources. Uh, and in particular, there are some uh, really egregious sources of light pollution that affect birds, because you can see the birds now flying around the lights from the September 11th uh, annual uh, memorial. And then this ridiculous light, the brightest light in the entire world, uh, at the Luxor in Las Vegas. This is 43 billion candle power. It can be seen by from 275 miles away. Uh, and it is completely useless uh, and obviously attracting birds uh, who are flying around it. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you guys know uh, better than I do about the flyways. And uh, fortunately, the one that comes over New York uh, allows you to see some interesting birds provided uh, that uh, they don't uh, get disoriented because they all navigate by the moon, stars, and the setting sun. Uh, and if the night is not dark, uh, that's going to create uh, confusion and disorientation. And as you know, and I'm bringing calls to Newcastle here, uh, almost up to a billion birds are killed annually uh, by crashing into, into buildings. And BirdCast, uh, I, I put this in for my uh, medical people to see because they didn't know about it, but I, I know that you guys do know about BirdCast, uh, where you have these radar stations that can track and count uh, bird migrations uh, on a 24-hour uh, basis. Uh, and uh, you can see that these are flying over many, the flyways are going over many, many urban lit up areas. So I'll give you a few examples of some of the actual research data uh, on uh, a number of bird species. There are many, many more to pick from, but I thought these were some of the more interesting ones. Um, obviously, one concern about uh, uh, lighting is whether it changes the clocks uh, in the birds themselves. And so using uh, light locking geolocators, um, a study was done looking at uh, purple martins. Uh, and if they had spent uh, time in an area that had more than 10 nights of artificial light, uh, they departed for the spring migration eight days earlier and arrived eight days earlier at the breeding sites compared to those that didn't experience any artificial light. And this could cause potential mistiming with the environmental conditions. So if they arrive before their food sources, uh, that could be a problem for them uh, and would have an impact on their survival or their reproductive success. Blackbirds that live in the city get up earlier and have a shorter circadian rhythm cycle uh, than birds that live in the forest of the same species. Um, some researchers uh, looked at the night flight, nocturnal flight of the Manx shearwaters uh, by introducing lights at a colony that had been previously in an area of low levels of light pollution. And they simply measured the density of birds in flight with a thermal imaging camera. Uh, and they found that fewer birds flew when the lights were on. Uh, when the lights were at higher light intensity, the effect was stronger, or when the duration was increased, uh, and when the light was in the green and blue end of the spectrum rather than red light. Uh, the common swifts uh, can, can live in a number of areas, and in one study, there were several populations that were not too far apart, uh, some living in a city wall, uh, some in the suburbs of that city, and some a little further out in a desert environment. So using acoustic loggers, uh, they looked at uh, the activity of these birds. And you can see that at night, most of the populations were quiet, whereas the ones living in the city wall were busy all night, rather substantially. Um, and the question is, if you want to know where this wall was, this is the wall that they were living in. And this, of course, is the, the Western Wall in, in Jerusalem. It's lit most of the night. 
uh, and people are busy and those birds are experiencing a very different environment uh, than their relatives that live just outside of town. Um, <clears throat> the zebra finches um, were exposed to Allen, uh, artificial light at night uh, and compared to birds that had a normal diurnal cycle. You can, with a bird, you can do a, a laboratory experiment. Uh, and the artificial light suppressed nocturnal melatonin production in a dose-dependent manner. The more light there was, the more suppression there was. Uh, and uh, they also noted that uh, the densities of the cells in their brains were decreased, suggesting that neurons were actually killed uh, by this light exposure. The willy wagtail, I did learn a lot of interesting bird names that when I did this, put this thing together for the first time. And, and uh, I actually asked up in Katona when I did this, if anybody had ever seen a willy wagtail, it seemed to me that it would be a rare bird, but apparently a number of people have, have seen it. Um, so they are nocturnal songbirds and uh, their singing behavior decreased in areas with high sky glow. Um, they were half as likely to sing in the presence of localized light sources. And so an experiment was done where they simply introduced street lights into these uh, nesting areas uh, and the song rates declined when the lights were turned on and they turned the lights off and the song rates went back up. Uh, so the, the impact is, is very direct. Um, brain activity can be measured in pigeons and magpies, right? Two very common birds in, in urban and suburban areas. Uh, we don't see that many magpies in New York, I don't think, but out in Colorado, you, you see plenty of them. Um, at urban uh, nightlight levels, they sleep less. Uh, Non-rapid eye movement uh, was preferred over REM sleep. REM sleep is more restorative. Uh, they slept less intensely and the sleep was fragmented. And snowy plovers, um, where there's artificial light uh, exceeding the luminance level of one half a full moon. Um, and so that's not very bright. Um, when the artificial light level exceeded that, uh, there was a decline in their, in their roosting uh, and their behaviors were disrupted, uh, which could increase the predation risk in illuminated coastal areas because these birds uh, obviously are, are coastal nesters. Um, now, many birds depend, or most birds depend on insects uh, and uh, widespread nocturnal artificial illumination disrupts the habitats of night active species, particularly night active uh, insect species. Insects have very enhanced blue and ultraviolet sensitivity. Here's a human uh, spectral curve, uh, all normalized for 300 to 700 nanometers. Uh, here's the honeybee and here is the fruit fly. And you can see how much more blue sensitivity and ultraviolet sensitivity they have. So there are major effects and it's, it's fairly easy to study insects uh, for these effects. Um, there's temporal disorientation and their biorhythms change. Uh, they lose their navigation ability in 3D space. Uh, they obviously are attracted to lights. Anybody out on a summer evening on a porch knows that. Uh, they get desensitized. Uh, and they fail to recognize uh, objects that they normally would be able to in the dark. They actually see better in the dark than they do in the light. And one more very interesting uh, uh, relationship between uh, uh, different phyla uh, and different species. Um, West Nile virus is a disease primarily uh, that, that the bird is the, is the vector, is the, is the, is the host. Uh, mosquitoes the vector, but sometimes humans or horses will uh, be infected and get West Nile virus disease. Um, a study was done exposing uh, sparrows in the laboratory uh, to West Nile virus and then uh, raising them either in artificial light or natural lighting conditions. And it was found that infectious West Nile virus was present in the blood on higher titers in the artificial light group. Uh, which would probably extend the infectious to vector window. Uh, so it may be that uh, there are more birds around with higher titers, resulting in higher titers in the mosquitoes that bite them and then come onto human beings. And this may have some effect on the epidemiology uh, and effectivity of West Nile virus. But what it mainly speaks to is the relationship 
uh, throughout the uh, the animal kingdom uh, between um, hosts uh, and prey and their food sources uh, and how they can uh, spread throughout the relationships between uh, birds, animals, and humans. So we can summarize by saying that artificial light acts as an environmental disruptor, disruptor with generally negative consequences on the brain, uh, physiology, and behavior, disrupts clock gene rhythms, neuronal activity, immune function, hormone function, reproductive behavior, metabolic function, foraging activity, and migratory behavior. All of these are true for humans, except maybe foraging activity. We don't really forage anymore unless we get up at night to go into the fridge. Uh, and migratory behavior is not a factor for human beings, but we all have clock gene rhythms, neuronal activity, immune systems, hormonal systems, and reproductive and metabolic functions. And we all have to remember that, that this is a, a species, an animal kingdom-wide problem that has happened in 140 years uh, for organisms that have evolved over, you know, millions of years. Uh, and remember, life has been present on the earth, uh, experiencing diurnal changes for 3.8 billion years, although the first 2 billion years or so were simply uh, single-celled organisms. In times of extreme stress, the whole concept of fitness, at least in a Darwinian sense, loses its meaning. How could a creature be adapted either for well or ill for conditions it has never before encountered in its entire evolutionary history? Elizabeth Colbert, in talking about this in The Sixth Extinction, um, which won the Pulitzer Prize, um, was really talking about climate change, um, but it's just as true for uh, artificial light at night, maybe not as dramatic effect on the Earth as a whole, uh, but certainly it's an impact uh, on living organisms and affecting their physiology uh, just as directly uh, as, as climate change. So what can we do? Uh, the International Dark Sky Association, which by the way, will be changing its name to Dark Sky. Everybody is, is condensing their, uh, their brand. Uh, it's the same organization under the same leadership, um, but they're uh, ratcheting up their, their advocacy as well as uh, the Audubons are. Um, so they have five principles of outdoor lighting, have it only on when needed, which is of course something that uh, you're obviously uh, attuned to uh, with the request you're making of the city government uh, to deal with uh, uh, light during migration seasons. Um, only light the area that needs it uh, rather than spill everywhere and be careful about what you consider uh, what need is. Uh, be no brighter than is necessary. Uh, minimize blue light emissions uh, by using those lower temperature, so-called warmer uh, LEDs and eliminate upward directed light. And you can see here what's obviously very bad when you shooting light directly into the sky where it's not needed. Uh, the best is completely to fully shield the fixtures. Even in this condition, 15% of the light is gonna reflect back up. Um, but to the extent that we can put in shielding, uh, that's always desirable. Uh, what can you do? You can advocate for lighting ordinances, not just uh, related to the migration season, um, but you know, throughout uh, uh, municipal government and county government and state government, uh, advocate for full shielding for all new outdoor lighting, uh, 3000 degree maximum color temperature, uh, turn the light off when the businesses are not open, uh, and have a lighting curfew for home accent lighting. My neighbor three houses down is a lovely guy with a nice new baby and a wonderful dog. Um, but he decided to light up his house and he has a timer on it, but it turns off at one in the morning. So he could probably turn it off at 10 or maybe as I suggested to him, don't do it at all. Your house is beautiful. Nobody's really going to look at it at night. And what do you care? But he still wants it. Um, the city of Pittsburgh has put in a lighting ordinance that includes all of these things and requires all new construction uh, to uh, have uh, 3000 Kelvin uh, maximum temperature lights and uh, all city buildings to turn off their lights at 6 p.m. and to have curtains and, and shutters and shades um, uh, and also to uh, uh, require, I think, a 10 p.m. Uh, curfew for uh, night lighting of homes. Um, but also 
advocate for compliance with lighting ordinances. What you see here is a shot from the Taconic Parkway uh, of the Granite Springs port, Sports Complex uh, in Yorktown Heights. Uh, this was a very lovely facility they built and they probably needed it. Uh, and the original uh, contract uh, called for completely uh, shielded fixtures so there would be no light trespass beyond the field. Uh, and when they built it, guess what? They used cheaper non-shielded non, uh, uh, fixtures. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, people who live in Shrub Oak were getting these lights shining directly into their houses about uh, two miles away. This is a two mile on the other side. Uh, so they, uh, they complained and uh, they actually contacted us and the Dark Sky Association. Uh, we uh, had some interaction with the town government and the answer was they don't want to spend another penny. They don't care. And one wonders whose brother-in-law uh, was the contractor from the guy on the council. You know, hmm. um, we don't really know. We can't really make any comments about it, but uh, these are very, very bright lights and, and they're also very blue. Let me go back up for a second. Um, some people are concerned about, uh, about crime. You know, there's not a lot of data that uh, adding lights actually decreases crime. And uh, uh, I don't think I included the study here, but there's a study in Chicago where they lit up uh, alleyways in some parts of town, but not others. Uh, and they measured the amount of crime before and after. Uh, and in different neighborhoods, some other neighborhoods didn't have any extra lighting in the alleys. And it turned out the amount of crime in both places was the same. Uh, needless to say, it increased in both places, but there was no effect of the lighting. Uh, a lot of this lighting uh, uh, has a lot of glare and uh, criminals can hide in the shadows just as easily as they can uh, hide in the dark. Uh, so there's uh, some question as to how valuable it is, but motion sensors would be one way to deal with uh, that. And at least you would be having less of a, a lighting impact. Obviously turn off your own lights uh, and then spread the word uh, to your neighbors uh, and businesses and others to try to adhere to the good lighting principles. And then maybe, just maybe we can get back to a view of the Milky Way uh, from Westchester or at least somewhere in Westchester uh, and see the glory of the night sky, but also help uh, our, our fellow creatures and help ourselves and uh, other human beings to get a good night's sleep uh, for the health restorative purposes that sleep has. Um, and then of course, you can come to our star parties at Ward Pound Ridge and actually see the Milky Way, which is really, really hard now, but it's a beautiful sight. And uh, if you have not been in a place where the Milky Way is visible, uh, somewhere out west on the ocean, uh, up on a mountain somewhere, uh, make sure you go and see it because uh, if you've ever been in an area where the Milky Way is so bright that it casts a shadow, uh, and we've been in a few places where that happens, it's really something extraordinary. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just remind you of our two organizations, the International Dark Sky Association and Westchester Amateur Astronomers. Uh, and I very much appreciate your inviting me for this talk and I can answer some questions and hope that I've given you some information that uh, you can use.